I was teaching plant systematics when my university closed in the spring of 2019 and I was forced to move my whole class and lab online. This is my story. To understand what I did, you need to understand a little bit about the audience I was addressing. UNC Greensboro is a very ethnically diverse institution. As you can see, ethnic minorities outnumber the students who self-identify as white by a considerable percentage. We also have a higher percentage of women than men, which is a relic of our history as the old women's college. My classes pretty well reflect this ethnic and gender diversity. The other thing you need to know about my classes is that they are almost all seniors and that they've had essentially no botany training when they enter the class. I would say that 60% of these students are graduating seniors and 35 to 40% will graduate in one more semester. We might in a typical semester have one junior, although I've had many semesters with no juniors. Now I said they have no botany training and that usually means that they have had no other botany courses until they come into this upper level plant systematics course. They've had a little bit of botany in introductory biology but basically they don't remember any of that. So this is my audience. The grading scheme that I used before and after the COVID-19 closures was a bit different, but it wasn't different in really significant ways. And in fact, if I had to do this again, I wouldn't change the grading scheme. One of the main things that I did was I changed the amount of points that we gave to the speaking assignments. Now the students do major speaking assignments in the course, by one third of the way through the course, the students are presenting all of the plant families. I'm lecturing on conceptual material, the history of systematics and et cetera, but they're doing all the work to present the plant families. So they do a considerable amount of work on these assignments. And I was afraid that when we had to present online, they wouldn't do as well, and I didn't want to penalize them for this. Now it turned out that I was wrong. They actually did better when they presented online most likely because they could turn off their cameras and concentrate on their slides. And they didn't have to worry about looking at the audience and what the audience was thinking about them. So if I had to redo my syllabus again, I wouldn't change anything when the university closed. I'm happy with the original percent pointages I gave. My lectures were given asynchronously. This was a lot of work. I decided to do it because I could use the lectures in another semester and because just serendipitously, I had had one of the lectures that I still needed already recorded from a previous semester. I used a convertible computer, used to be called a tablet, so that I could annotate my lectures. Let's have a look at what that looked like. We're going to continue our study of the schools of systematics by turning to our last of the three schools, phylogenetic systematics. This is going to be very important, and if we trace zero up, we find that it has no changes on the tree and it is retained in taxa B and C. I asked the students to take notes on the lectures and they did pretty darn good at this. These are two examples of two different students' notes from one of the lectures and if I had to do this again, as I am going to have to do it again in the fall for a different class, I'm going to have the students start taking notes right from the very beginning and I will start grading them as I graded these so that by a couple weeks into the class we have all the students taking this quality of notes on the lectures. I also gave them readings and I gave them questions on the readings that they had to turn in for a grade. I tried to choose papers from the primary scientific literature but papers that these students could understand. Again, remember they had no previous botany backgrounds. So to help them with some of the terminology and unknown concepts, I annotated the PDFs for these readings and the boxes that you see here, like the one in red, were my annotations. So they could click on those and gain a little bit of deeper understanding about what the authors were saying. Put the author's words into context. I then gave them questions that they had to turn in. This is the example of the question I asked on Sokol. They tended to be questions that were mainly factual in nature. That is, I wanted to know if they understood what was in these readings. If I had to do this again, I would ask more conceptual questions. 
Well, of course, I would scaffold that. I would start off with more kind of factual things. Did you understand what the author said? And then as I went on in the semester, I would give them harder questions that would ask them to compare different readings or to draw conclusions that weren't directly from the paper. I was relatively happy with how this worked, but as I say, I would try to do more conceptual questions in the future. Here are two examples of student answers. All I want you to see here is that some students gave quite long answers given the questions. They went in some detail to show that they really understood it, whereas others addressed the question very narrowly. The student presentations went very well, as I said. Let's have a look at some of those. Let's take a look at some slides that a student prepared for one of their presentations. They were required to go over the technical features of the family, which they did usually in one or two slides, sometimes with a grid number of images. Here are the detailed characteristics that they would discuss. And then they had to discuss the distribution of the family. They almost invariably used Peter Stevens' website at Missouri Botanical Garden to get the distribution maps. And then the phylogenetic position, first with a phylogeny taken out of their textbook, Simpson. And then I encouraged them to look in the primary literature for a phylogeny of the family and to show that it was monophyletic. Now, I played a trick on them is that I you did include some families that were not monophyletic. So some of my circumscriptions are not monophyletic, so the students could not assume that the family that they received was monophyletic. In this case, it was. But if it was not monophyletic, they had to discuss why and discuss what would be needed to make it monophyletic. They then moved on to talk about the various genera, and they were supposed to go into some detail about the genus or genera that were required. Let's take a look at a video to see how this student handled some of the material. My name is Casey, and today I will be presenting on the family of Polymoniaceae and the genus Phlox. So the genus Phlox has the characteristic actinomorphic pentamerous tubular flowers. Um, pictured here, you can see the salver, salver form shape with the five lobes of the corolla. And the way that the lobes fuse into a long tube, as well as um, the Sensipolis calyx. We also used iNaturalist. iNaturalist was both really good and somewhat problematic. It was good because it got the students outside and looking at the plants in ways that they couldn't do before. It was problematic because we couldn't do the same number of taxa with iNaturalist that we did or would have done within the labs when the labs were running and because it was immensely time consuming. As you're about to see, let's look at how we handled iNaturalist. The iNaturalist assignments were given both as a Word document and as an Excel sheet. Here's a copy of the Word document. You can see it contains the list of the required genera that they were required to find for that week, and then some instructions about what they were supposed to do and what happens if they couldn't find one of the required genera. They were allowed to substitute something. How to paste the URLs in. We'll look at the Excel sheet in just a minute. And then some instructions about using multiple images. Write a, they have to write a description of the plant that they see. And we originally were adding them to a class project on iNaturalist, but we stopped worrying about that, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Then we had a very simple grading rubric that we used for this. We only had two categories here, correct or not correct but we would allow intermediate grades in this, but we just didn't feel like we had the time to put together the rubric or to do the analysis to tell them exactly what a three meant versus a two meant versus a one meant. And in any case, the students generally got full credits on these things, as we'll, as we'll see. They did a very good job on it. And then there are some indications of where they could find the things. Now, in addition to these general indications, we also went out before the lab and scouted the locations to find out what was in flower. 
So the list of the plants that were in flower, which was given at the very top, was based on our scouting that took place early in the week. This was extremely time consuming and I couldn't have done it alone. Okay, I said there was also an Excel sheet. So here's an example of the Excel sheet that they received. It has the same families listed in it, the same genera. The common names are here and then there's a place to put in their iNaturalist observation. That is, they had to paste the URL to that iNaturalist observation here. We then reproduced the grading rubric here with the different kinds of things they could get credit for and the total number of points that were possible on that. So when we graded these, we just had to come to the Excel sheet that the students turned in and fill in a number in each of these places and it would give us a total automatically. Let's look at what one of the students turned in for an assignment. So we can see this student did not find all the plants. Some of the plants have their URLs here, but some of them are black and in some cases they just forgot to delete the red text that was there. Those should really also be blank. So if they couldn't find all of the plants, they were allowed to substitute other plants that they had not seen before and to paste URLs in. So that's this student took advantage of that and they received pretty good points for that. Well, this worked pretty well, but it was still very time consuming to grade these. So to grade them, we had to click on each of these URLs and wait for the browser to open. And then we could see the student submission and see if they had submitted the required multiple photographs, see if they had GPS coordinates associated with their photographs, see if the identification was correct, and check their description of the organism. Make sure they just didn't cut and paste this from somewhere. So that took a minute or two for each observation. And there were a lot of observations. And in our class, we only had 17 students, so it was tractable. But if you had a class of 100 students, this would not be tractable. This was the way we got iNaturalist to work for us. It was still a heck of a lot of work. I was happy with how it worked. The students were out in the field. <clears throat> Some of them commented at the end that they had made it a family outing at a time when they couldn't get out of the house for other reasons. They took their wife and their dog out. And they um, went out and they found these plants and they really enjoyed it. So it was very pedagogically effective, but it was a time sink that would be very hard to repeat with more than about 20 students in the class. I used some active learning software that I had developed to give them homeworks that helped them to improve their plant identification skills. This is open source visual learning software that's free to use. And it's easy to add your own images. First, let me describe how the software works. This is what the program looks like when it's running. These top four buttons are for selecting the taxa that you want the students to learn or that you want to learn yourself. And the bottom four buttons are different ways in which you can learn the taxa. We're going to look at the group selection box. Clicking on that brings up some other kinds of dialogues. And here we can select families and see just the gen genera and the types of photographs we have of those genera and select multiple ones if we want, multiple families, and see all the genera in those families. Or we can go in and select a genus. We'll see the family that it occurs in, and we'll see the types of photographs that we have of those species. So let's just choose Acer here and say we want to look at the leaves of Acer. And we can see we have the total number of 39 images we can now choose if we want to study those leaves by the family, by the genus, or by the species with a scientific name or the species with a common name. We'll select species with a scientific name. So we've got our taxa selected. Let's study those images a little bit. In the study section, we can look at the images in alphabetical order, or we can randomize them. We'll randomize them today. We can look at them with the arrow keys, or we can have them displayed automatically. If we select the arrow keys, we don't have an option to change the image display time. If we have them 
displayed automatically, we can choose how long the images appear on the screen. We'll use the arrow keys. We can see the image only if we want to remont, kind of quiz ourselves very quickly on the identifications. We think we know them pretty well. Or we can see them with their name if we are just learning them. We also have the option of showing the family name. So let's you leave that checked and we'll go on and see what this looks like. And so now we see our leaves of Acer with a family name on them, with a specific name on them, and we can flip through them with the arrow keys. I'll just press the escape key to jump out of this and we'll go on to take a quiz. We see that there are four types of quizzes, <clears throat> image naming with prompt, image naming without prompt, image comparison, and image verification. For all of these options, we can set the display time of the image. We'll just leave it here at, let's say, 0.8 seconds. So the image is going to appear on the screen for 8 tenths of a second. A response box will appear. We then type the name in that response box. This is pretty easy because we have the name on the screen now. But for students who have never seen these names, this is really great practice. We hit continue and we get a feedback about whether we are correct or not. We're just going to quit out of this so that we can go on and look at one of the other types of the images. Let's look at take a quiz again. We'll do it the hard way now without the prompt on the screen. Again, eight seconds or eight tenths of a second for the image display. Now the image is going to display. It disappears and we get a response box. I'm just going to get this answer wrong. And when I got it incorrect, I get some options. I can press the yes key and see the correct answer if I want to before repeating the question. I can press no or N and go on to the next question. Or I can press any other key to repeat the question without seeing the answer and without going on to the other question. So let's just press yes. And we see the correct answer quickly. And this time I got it right. And we go on to the next question. We'll quit again and look at how we did on the quiz. And now we see we got zero right. And we got zero right because we missed it the first time. So even though the student is getting another chance to get the answer correct, they did not get it correct the first time. So you can use this as a way to grade their progress. That is, they have to get it correct the first time to get credit here and they can print this out or they can create a capture a screenshot and upload that to your learning management system. Well, that's a brief introduction to visual learning plan identification. It does a lot of other things, but for now, we'll stop here. You can add your own images to VLPI, which is one of the really nice things I think about it. All you have to do is open the image directory. This is just a directory on your hard drive. You see all the images that are in the program here, and you just take your images that you want to add to the program and you drop them into this directory. They can be named anything they want. They don't have to be named with numbers. The names can be the names of the species, etc. Once you've got them in this directory, you have to take the names and you have to copy them out into the database. The database is just a comma separated values file dot csv file it opens in excel and you can see the first column over here these are the names of the of the images so you put the names of the images there you fill in the rest of the data and the program does the work your images are now in the program and you're all set to go we wanted to know that this software really works and so a few years ago we conducted a controlled experiment in my classroom the results were that we found that the software worked very well both in the tests at the end of the semester. We're looking at the darker colored bar here, which was their result, the students' results when they used the software versus their results when they used more traditional study methods. We brought them back six months later and re-ran some tests on some students and found the same discrepancy. That is, they, the students who had used the software did much better than the students who did not. Here's the citation for the paper. The final exam was given in two ways. The first way was 
what I've talked about already. I gave them some readings and asked questions about that. I also gave them a few longer essay questions that they had to do before the official time of the exam, the time of the synchronous exam. And I was pretty happy with the way those homework questions turned out. They weren't questions that they could really answer by looking something up or getting a resource. They had to think about something. So I was happy with that and I was reasonably happy with their answers. In the exam uh, that was synchronous, we had three different kinds of questions. The first were these kinds of written questions. Now I handled this in a very specific way. I had 195 of these questions, which we got into a database in Canvas. That was not an easy task. It was very time consuming. But once we were there, it, let me it allowed me to do this. I could create a quiz and draw 10 random questions out of this batch of 195 questions. I could then allow the students to take that quiz as many times as they wanted before the synchronous exam, not for credit, but for practice. And this gave them the kind of practice that they should have been doing on their own, but didn't seem capable of knowing how to organize. So I was very happy with how this worked out, and they did better on these questions, which were again randomly drawn from this set, on the synchronous exam than I had seen in many years. They also had image identification questions, and of course, based on VLPI, they did very well on these. Of course, the images were not images they had ever seen before. They were not images from within the program. And the third and most minor part of the synchronous final exam were these true and false questions that covered some of the conceptual material in the course. This was a very minor part of the exam. Well, how did it go overall? What worked well and what didn't? The student presentations worked very well. and There was really no problem at all moving them on to um, online presentations as long as they didn't have to have their camera on. Some of the students didn't have, even have cameras, so it worked fine having them off. The lecture notes worked very well. I was very happy with that and would do that again, as did the reading assignments ho and homework and using those to be part of the final exam, breaking the final exam into homework and synchronous questions. Visual learning plan identification always works well, and it continued to work well in this situation. iNaturalist had positive and negatives, but the big negative was it was a major time can sink, and I could not have done that work if I didn't have help. Recording the lectures was also very time consuming, and editing them was time consuming, but they're available for other semesters now. And creating the quizzes and the exams in the learning management system, which is Canvas for us, again, was very time consuming. Some of that will go over to other semesters and some of it was just a big time sink that is not gonna be replicated because I can't give the same quizzes again. And I have to give a big thanks to April Harris. April Harris was the staff member who was assigned to set up my labs and when the university closed, I think she was a little apprehensive about her job and she volunteered to help any way that she could in the course. She basically ran the iNaturalist assignments. If I hadn't had April out there scouting for the plants and grading those assignments, I could not have done it. I couldn't have handled all the requirements here. She also was the person who copied those 195 questions from a Word document into, um, into Canvas and got them ready for me to edit. So a big thank you to April, and that was my story. I hope you found it helpful.